All right. Thank you all for uh, hanging in with those technical issues there, as well as me being fashionably late. Um, I know it's going to be great, right? Um, thank you all for coming at 8 p.m. on a Friday. Um, my name is Kelly Klinger, and I'm here to talk to you about biomedical visualization. So if I could just get a show of hands real quick, uh, is there anybody that kind of came into this prior to hearing about this that has any idea has ever heard of biomedical visualization? So, wait, wait, maybe if you can come in, maybe you can kind of guess what it's about. But uh, anyway, yes, uh, I'm pretty used to giving the shield because it's a not particularly well-known field. It is quite niche. But it's everywhere. And I think y'all are probably going to start noticing after this talk just how present we are as biomedical visualizers and pretty much any kind of science and learning and medicine and all of that stuff. So um, if you have any questions at any point, feel free to raise your hand and interrupt me. Um, we can do a QA at the end too, if you would like. But I don't mind people jumping in and just chit chatting. Take me where you want to go. Uh, learn what you want to learn. This is your Friday night at 8 p.m. So uh, we will go from there. So one thing we are going to be doing is a little bit of interactivity where sometimes we're going to get some polling and, you know, get some feedback from y'all. So pick out your phones, keep them on hand for the extent of this presentation, because uh, we are going to be doing some Slido polls. Um, so I will take a moment for y'all to be able to scan this. And, uh, and let's see, I will go ahead and I think I should be able to click this. I made it clickable. Yes, I did. All right, um, so this is my presenter view. And we're just gonna do a few kind of like icebreaker pulls slash me just getting a pulse for the room um, before we carry on and also me making sure technology works. So, um, play, hang on. My first question to y'all that you should see on your phone right now is I'm just curious to know, this is of course DigiCane, but what are some of y'all's favorite hobbies? So I assume art is probably one of them. But uh, I don't know what else do you guys know? Gaming, very cool. Singing, art, cooking, watching YouTube, drawing a really big one. Yeah, so the more people that submit something, the bigger it gets in the sort of cloud view, which makes my brain happy. Um, synchronized figure skating, knitting, watching YouTube video essays, me too um about like literally anything like I'll watch one on The Bachelor even though I've like never seen an episode of The Bachelor in my life uh, napping also me too crocheting swimming spending time with dogs kind of all right cool I better put to spend a whole lot of time on this playing with my cat I have three cats um they're COVID cats but anyway so <laughs> I just wanted to kind of get a feel for the kinds of things y'all are into, because one of the things I'm going to be talking about is how interdisciplinary, if you know the buzzword, right, but how interdisciplinary biomedical visualization really is. So I'm keeping these in the back of my mind specifically. Next question. Y'all here in undergrad at University of Michigan, what do you want to be when you grow up, when you, when you get past this... Uh, this part of your life, this stage in your educational career, and theoretically, you gotta start making money at some point. So, uh, yeah, what do you all want to be? Got a lot of answers coming in here. I see a lot of concept artists. I see a lot of video game developers. I see some therapists, physical assistants, doctor, astrophysicists. Wow, rich. Yeah, I like that one. That's really well programmer. Not in college, hopefully. I've got great news for you about graduating college. Um, I saw a medical illustration in there. Awesome. Okay. Fulfilled. Okay, now we're getting existential. <laughs> Number one, play alive. Alive's great. Stay alive. Graphic novelist. Okay. Computer scientist. A tall and handsome man. You know, me too sometimes. Specifically that. Uh, <laughs> biomedical illustrator. Eyes emoji. Okay. Cool. All right. And then the last question. This is a fun one for me. I'll tell you why. When you were a little kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Doctor, teacher, fashion designer, firefighter, archaeologist, marine biologist, a uh, tall and handsome man. Somebody hasn't changed their plans at all, and I respect it. <laughs> um, veterinarian, firefighter, YouTuber. Oh man, everything. That's so cool. 
Okay, barber, respect, super villain. Uh huh. You still can. You can be a part time super villain. Um. Okay. So I like asking this question because the answers I get when I ask my students in biomedical visualization is usually doctor and veterinarian, or for whatever reason, we all become medical administrators. We start off wanting to be doctors, we don't have time, we like animals, and like learning about pets and public creatures, and uh, then we realize that takes a lot of work. So, um, yeah, so the fact that doctor and veterinarian to me are always like interesting, how that's always the thing. But we do have a lot of really, you know, diverse desires. Um, pirate, gas station owner. Yeah, that's a real kid dream right there. I like it. Um, okay, so thank y'all for indulging me in that, just breaking the ice and making sure the polling works um, and helping me understand who y'all all are. But I'm going to carry on. So I've already been up here talking for a little while, but I haven't necessarily introduced the whole spectrum of who I am, right? So as I said, my name is Kelly Kloeninger. I am a professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago where I teach in one of the four graduate programs for medical illustration in North America. So biomedical visualization, graduate program, meaning a master's degree. There's four of them in North America. We accept 20 students a year. We are the biggest program. Uh, Johns Hopkins accepts about six a year. Uh, Augusta, Georgia accepts about 15, 10 to 15, and Toronto accepts about 15 to 22. So, I give you those numbers not to freak out anybody who wants to get into this field because I've seen y'all's work already shown me and I think y'all have, you know, you can do it for sure. But um, to just kind of explain how small kind of it and niche we are um, and that a lot of people haven't heard of us. So it's always a bit of a unique and interesting discussion of how do you end up where you are? Um, and I'll also talk more about what he does in a moment. But, um, I am specifically a professor in 3D art. So um, I grew up really, really loving art and video games, um, pretty tech savvy mind and also really like science. And it was really hard to find something that would marry all of those interests together. Like how are you simultaneously like getting really excited over different types of cartilage in your elbow but also like in video games at the same time? Like, you can't make a career out of that, but you can. Um, <laughs> So um, 3D ended up being the path I went down. At one point in time, I thought I wanted to be a doctor. At one point in time, I thought I wanted to be a, a veterinarian. I took the MCAT. I was getting all ready to go to med school. Um, and I was a person and worked with for two years at an art store, um, where I realized at the end of the day, I love science. And I just couldn't learn I hated being in a lab. Um, it just wasn't fun for me. So it was like this really weird thing to do bit. Um, and so that's why I worked in Tillman Art School for three years, which was, I joke about it, but also the place where I really rekindled my personal love for art, having been a hard science I had a degree in chemistry with a double minor in biology and psychology. So I swore off art completely for a number of years. Um, a lot of the people that come into our graduate program, um, we don't really care what your initial degree is, so long as you need the requirement to get into our program. So we have about 50% art people, fine arts, very heavy background, who probably minored in science and took the anatomy kind of class and took the prerequisites. And then we also have the hard science majors that went and took some studio art classes to build up their portfolio. So it's an interesting clash of the two worlds. And our art program gets to have the best of both, in my opinion. We also take in like humanities people. Um, so we have study degrees and some more like humanity based stuff, um, communications. There's a lot of value in all of these different undergraduate degrees. So uh, we don't really reject people based upon who didn't major in the right thing. Because <laughs> what do you major in to get into this field? Hard to say. Um, so at the end of the day, um, my path was like I said, chemistry, existential crisis. Uh, working at an art store, and then learning about this field from my friends who went into it, and then being like, well, I guess I'll go do that. Um, and then I got a left. So um, I graduated and actually, uh, prior to becoming a professor, I worked in the medical communication industry. And I can talk a little bit more about what that entails. So that's where a lot of people go to like, scientific writing and like if you're a real science minor person that don't really make or like, want to go the uh, researcher route or the doctor route, medical communication is a great place to go. So I landed there, and uh, I landed there particularly making scientific animations. So everybody ever seen like 
pharmaceutical companies love these innovations where it's like it's like this mystical floating environment on you know molecular level and you've got a blob that floats in and it looks great and it does something with another blob and you've got a narrator who's probably British is talking over top of it. Yeah, gladiators. Um, they pay a lot of money for those. Um but it is, you know, it kind of enchants you need to understand all of the aspects of what makes pretty animation start to finish, how to plan animation, how to lay out the animation, but you also need to understand how to make this accurate, right? So most people are going to look at animation and say, wow, that's a blob, you need something with another blob. Your client is probably going to be the one human on planet Earth who's going to look at that molecular blob and be like, you know, the single word on this section is actually misformed. Uh, how could you possibly get that wrong? Um, you have to be able to talk at certain level if you're doing secondary animation in a pharmaceutical industry. Um, so that's where we come in, is kind of having that niche level of expertise. And I will definitely say, even though I have a chemistry degree undergrad, I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember any of it. I don't know what the morality is. I don't know what's a hydrogen bond, whatever. Um, <laughs> rather than having this encyclopedia of scientific knowledge in your head at your disposal at any point in time, it's just being able to learn it, understand it well enough to represent it and to create it. It's knowing what questions to ask the actual expert. Um, and just really being able to talk on their level. Even if you are not studying up to the degree, they are in front of you can't be because they are the expert who has devoted their PhD and life to it, right? So I don't want to scare people away by talking about like molecular visualizations in your plan. I have failed with him, like <laughs> not for me. You know, if you like learning, you like science, you're interested in anything scientific, it's okay, but that's also not like your strongest suit. It's more of a passion for it than like being the best person at it. Um, I also have included here, I will uh, send this presentation to everybody or send it to DigiPay if you want to kind of take a look at it later. But I included some links throughout for things like the website for the Association of Medical Illustrators, which is kind of our official association. Where you can also go and learn more about this profession and you can even already join as students there's no requirement that you have to be a professional so if you would like to join and just start showing up and things like that or be included in the forum and see what it's about you are more than welcome to do so all right well that's not the right top there's a lot of stuff going on here so i've talked a lot about this but i have not answered a pretty crucial question which is <laughs> At the end of the day, what is what is biomedical visualization? What is the topic we are even discussing right now? And uh, biomedical visualization at its core is not any one medium or type of art. It's not any one way of doing anything. But it's really about the essence of bridging the gap to communicate science in more visual ways. By thinking of the best way for people to learn science, thinking of ways to break down these abstract concepts, represent things that we can study and learn and just kind of share this breadth of knowledge that we have in the scientific fields. Biomedical visualization started off most commonly kind of locally as like medical illustrations. So if y'all think about like the old Leonardo da Vinci drawings or the salience is what I have here, the really old kind first anatomists were hiring artists to draw things accurately. Uh, and that was the foundation of the study of human anatomy, which is really cool, right? So us artists have actually been side by side with scientists ever since a scientist decided to take a look at the human body and got that. Um, and that is where we've been this whole time. We are not a very celebrated profession, but we are always here. There are, you know, medical illustrators all throughout history. And as time has evolved, we have evolved past uh, just illustration and movement to pretty much any other kind of medium that you can possibly create. So in our graduate program, we have our illustration classes. And we have our interactive and serious gaming classes where you learn to use Unity, the Unity game engine, in order to make medical apps and interactives. We have UI UX and web development. We have those 3D modeling graphics in mind. Um, we have the animation track. We have the anaplastology track. The anaplastology is making prosthetics for patients who have often undergone, like, you know, facial trauma and need something reconstructed on their face. We have the medical legal, which is making medical illustrations for court cases. Um, so we offer all these classes in a two-year graduate program. That's a lot. But um, the point being that you can go so many places with this. Um, so if you have a particular medium you like, or you want to explore more videos, um, Venus, biomedical visualization is a great place to do so. And oftentimes, you don't need to specialize. If you want to be an all-rounder, there are wonderful places where you can end up. So at the core of what we do is 
we learn the science, we talk about the science, and then we try to think about how people learn. And we think about who our audience is for a specific topic. And then we try to figure out what's the best way to communicate this topic to them. So it actually goes into a lot of psychology and learning theory too. So if that's something you're interested in, I have a lot of students who love to do the conceptual parts of like, I just like to think about how to think. And then I don't think about how to maybe conceptualize something so that they understand that material. And then some people that can be your whole job and then you hand it off to the artist and then make the thing. So um, there was a little bit of that in my job too. I had an army of graphic designers who would do like my presentations for me. I just told them what to put where. It felt great. <laughs> So, whoops, let's see. And I've been talking it up this whole time, but it comes down to the fact that what we make is extremely varied. And what I've got here is just our biomedical visualization demo reel. So I'm talking about biomedical visualization in general, but this is the demo reel of the stuff that our graduate students have made within the last couple of years at the program that I teach at. All right, so. Go kind of speaks for itself in the kinds of things that people make. And as I said, those are all our students that have graduated uh, since about 2015, 2016 or so. All right, I have a question for you and I forget what this one is. So it's exciting for me too. Um, so, when muscle tissue is stimulated no, 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 stop. No. This <laughs> Go away, okay, okay. Autoplay, ah, yes, so. Here we go. Next poll. What are some skills that you think a good biomedical artist should have now that I've just shown you the kind of stuff we make? What do you think it takes to make them? Uh, 
All right. Imagination and creativity. Yes, I love that. Patience, definitely. Attention to accuracy, anatomy terminology, adaptability, communication, attention to details, spatial and air awareness, uh, reading medical scans, understanding, jack of all trades. That's a good one. Color theory, medical knowledge. Let's see. What else do we got here? Oh, it keeps changing every time my eyes try to say what read words. Um, ability to visualize detail. Right, good communication. Yep, yeah, art, communication, attention to detail, imagination, patience, medical knowledge, anatomy. Yeah. So hopefully y'all can kind of get a feel of that. There's a lot of different skills that uh, that are required in order to, you know, make a good biomedical visualization. And I really actually love that y'all make creativity as one of the biggest ones. Because it's one of my personal biggest rights that a lot of science visuals are boring. They're just not fun to look at, right? And we all know you're more engaged when you're having fun. So that's one of my core principles. When I try to make any kind of visualization, it's kind of fun. Let's take a look at how we can create and actually get people excited about like a chemistry topic that nobody cares about, right? So uh, that is one of my personal passions. And so I like to integrate things like you know, my knowledge of like the game industry and what keeps people hooked on games and how can I apply that to something like, you know, chemistry in order to get people to read what I am trying to get them to read. So the kinds of things that go into biomedical visualization from the perspective of a professor is first of all, a passion for learning. So a couple of y'all said they have knowledge of anatomy and medical systems and stuff like that. And if that's not the knowledge, so much as it's enjoy learning and experience itself. So. Um, I am learning things on the fly every time. Anytime I get a new topic I have to animate or visualize, I pretty much have to learn it from scratch. But it's kind of, you know, enjoying that process a little bit. Uh, there is raw artistic skill involved. So y'all are in DigiPaint. Um, I know y'all like art. I saw it on our, our little workshop here. So just honing those artistic skills is going to be quite significant in making good visualizations. Scientific curiosity, so wanting to always go just one layer deeper so you can explain what's going on. So you might read a sentence and it says, you know, uh, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, it's not going to be Friday. Um, so, you know, always checking why, why is it this way, why does the body work this way, is there a reason our echo lies in the back of our brain is the way it is? Um, why is that like what can go wrong? You know, really understanding comprehensively like a, a topic. You're the kind of person that likes listening to like podcasts about like really interesting like topics, like yeah, that sort of stuff. Um, accessibility focused is one I want to emphasize because this is one of my key issues that's kind of really at the front of what our field is facing right now. And that if y'all think too, for example, you're in that textbooks, um, and like science texts and stuff like that, then think about the kind of person that is represented in them. What gender are they? Male. Well, what skin color are they? And what's, you know, the body type? Thin, average, yeah. So medical illustration for a long time has kind of been like a lot of other fields, focusing on representing male, thin, white, able body. And we, of course, know human anatomy and science and medicine is so diverse and diverse as people in general. So what our program focuses on nowadays is about, okay, we have visualized the white male experience. <laughs> you know, not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's been done. So how can we start visualizing other experiences? What does shield look like on a dark skin tone versus a white skin tone? That has serious clinical implications, right, for diagnosis for doctors. But if they are not alerting that shingles can present different people with different skin tones, they will misdiagnose shingles more often, right? And what do these conditions look like for the body that's perhaps gender non conforming right now in the world, right? You know, your body goes through a lot of changes. What can you expect? Things of that nature are sorely underrepresented in our field right now. And so that is something that is a very key importance going forward. So we always try to push the gauntlet, you know, I say push the gauntlet, but just question who are you representing and why? Make it deliberate. So moving on, there is the love for technology. So y'all saw a lot of the really cool fancy schmancy stuff means learning programs on top of things. 
So in my 3D modeling classes, I am teaching you getting the end of making a 3D program do stuff in addition to how to visualize accurately. Communication is also at the core of what we do. So a good visualizer is often a good communicator. And that doesn't always mean you're the best at getting up and talking in front of people, although often that is the case. Um, but it just means knowing how to explain what you want to explain in a way that you connect with who you're talking to. So seeing at their level, using the terms they know, and being able to really bridge that gap is really a fundamental tenet. Attention to accuracy is an important one. You don't have to know everything off the top of your head, but you have to care about getting it right. Um, and then the last one is innovation. One of the things I really, really love about being in my position is that we get to bring in students who have kind of skills and abilities that have not yet been applied to the field of medical administration. An example, I saw somebody have the uh, hobby of like knitting. We have a student doing their graduate thesis project on, uh, she had a background in um, fibers, so fabrics. So what she's doing is looking at how can different fabrics kind of relate to different kinds of cells in the map, and how can we make models of those for digital students so that they understand the cellular makeup of what's going on in your bones, because that is clinically important, using fabrics so that the students have models to hold and stuff like that. We have a whole research project on it. We've had a research project where we have a student who is really into kind of fancy full top games and stuff. So her thesis project was on can we make a text-based fancy adventure using illustrations and stuff like that that kind of employs uh, uh, like cognitive theories for kind of walking through the stages of coping with depression. And they make it kind of an interactive game experience and gather some data to see, you know, how does this compare to something that's a little more textbook. Um, so hopefully things like this spark your brain of like, how can we take what you love, all that stuff y'all listed at the beginning, and apply it to things like medicine and science. And the cool thing about our field is that we are open to anything. If you have a good idea of, I think VRB would be a great way to combat postpartum depression, I'm like, yeah, let's see. Let's try it, right? Like, let's throw, throw people in there and gather some data and publish a thesis on it. Um, so this is really fun, is the sky is the limit. Um, and we're here to really support you with that. And there's a lot of companies and things like that that are also kind of in that cutting edge, like really want to just explore. There are also lots of companies that just want to do the same old, same old because they're like doctors and pharma companies. So it's, it's a little bit of both. I'm trying not to oversell it here. <laughs> so y'all might be wondering, what are my, my career prospects? So I'll go ahead and run y'all some numbers. Um, in order for UIC, our program, to stay accredited, we have to have a 92% job placement year within a year of everybody graduating. Um, so that means within a year of graduating, 92% of our graduates have to get the job they want. Um, our number is actually 95. So in a class of 20, that basically means one or two people end up somewhere else every year, but the other 18 uh, end up in the field within a year. So those are pretty good numbers, right? Like, not so bad. And that was even the case during COVID as well. In 2020, it stayed the same. Um, and there's lots of things you can do. And I would actually say the hardest part about getting a job as a medical illustrator is uh, convincing people like they need you. There are no job postings for just a medical illustrator. You will not go on Indeed and just start applying to all those random jobs like you could for like a nurse or a computer scientist or something like that, a graphic designer. That's not a thing. So you do gotta do a bit more legwork. You gotta do some cold emails, which sucks. You gotta, you know, apply for jobs, but then make sure you twist in your cover letter all this other cool stuff that you can do for them. You gotta network a little bit, and you gotta really kind of put your feelers out. But the cool thing is, is that once your resume gets in front of somebody who's making this stuff, everybody gets a job. Like, if you want one, you get one. <laughs> for the most part. I can't promise that, but yes. <laughs> um, so, we have to wear a lot of different hats in the end. Our job requires a lot of different skills, so we will do different things per day, usually depending upon what's required. So some of the things you can do, I've got listed here. There are e-learning companies that make kind of those little e-learning modules where you can go through and learn about things like drugs for like doctors or sales reps is a big one in the farm industry. I've done so many of those, not my favorite. Um, you know, just kind of those like standard e-learning modules and even slide decks with PowerPoints. Like there's a good market if you just like making PowerPoint. 
Um, I actually have a research team right now where we are just rethinking the fundamentals of how to make a good PowerPoint. And I'm all for it. I think it's awesome. <laughs> I have thoughts. But um, he went on to do things a bit more technical, like surgical simulation development. So one of the companies that we collaborate with really heavily is called Oso VR. And Oso VR is about getting into VR and simulating surgeries for doctors so that they can practice it. Ooh, he's spinning. Um, <laughs> so there's companies out there. It's kind of a blend. I think at this point, they're structured a lot like game companies. So you're going to have your artists and kind of like your tiers of different like uh, expertise and things like that. Um, but you can make, you know, VR, surgical simulators, or AR, or things like that. Um, medical legal, I alluded to that one before. So medical legal, it's this entire little sub-industry of medical illustration where you are illustrating injuries for malpractice cases or injury cases. So you will either be hired by the prosecution or defense attorneys, there's companies for this, and they, you're there to represent what happened to a person. And of course, it's really important because when you're doing something like a malpractice case, you have to prove the doctor screwed up. So, um, you know, and if you just stand up there and talk about the procedure, the jury's not going to know what's up. So there's an entire subset of medical legal to kind of represent what happens to these people. What's the trauma that occurs? So if you're kind of like, it's kind of gruesome. Like, you have to be okay looking at gruesome stuff if you want to be a med legal. And sometimes there's like this fine line of like, prosecution will want you to make it look just a little gory or perhaps then like, you know, to like, there, there's, there's some uh, ethical gray areas in there for sure. Um, but that's illustration, animation, um, is usually the two main things that medical illust legal illustrators will use in order to create this stuff. There's molecular animations, and not just molecular animations, but patient animations and Nat Geo animations. One of the companies we collaborate with is Microverse, and they used to do a whole lot of animations for the Discovery Channel on just like those science shows, right? Like how things work. Um, I need to put some in here so I can make fun of them for that. But <laughs> um, so you can do a bunch of just kind of like scientific animation. Um, another one y'all might have seen is there was one where there was like a skeleton reconstructing in that demo reel. Um, we collaborate with the University of Chicago, which has a paleontology lab. Um, and Paul Cerrito is the head of it, and he is real like Indiana Jones. He goes to Africa, does archaeology excavations, brings that stuff back, scans it, and then has our students reconstruct it in 3D so he can examine how the stuff might have worked. One of my, my old roommates for a full research project was reconstructing the foot of a child that they found in Africa to try and understand the evolution of how people started to walk on two legs by keto. Um, so we get to collaborate with them. So if you like dinosaurs and you like archaeology, um, there's also an anthropologist there, so kind of the history of human evolution versus the history of animal evolution. There's a whole subset of that. A multimedia technician is the hat I wore in medical communications, and that's basically you can do a little bit of everything. Uh, so you will do whatever the project requires at the time. So that was illustration, there was graphic design, there was uh, a little bit of interactive development, there was web, UI, UX development. Um, everything, project management even. And the last one is art director, or even a project management role. So if you're one of those people that kind of, you know, you like understanding it, but like you like thinking on the bigger picture and thinking through the processes and the steps, there are a lot of like project manager, art director sort of roles where your job is to kind of coordinate all the pieces of everything going on and really keep everything tied together. So if you're a schedule person, a list person, you like sending emails, um, and also you have a thorough understanding of how to make this stuff, you don't go very far, far and probably get paid the most in that position. Um, average starting salary for our 2020 grads, by the way, was about 65,000, I wanna say. Um, most of them made above 60,000. There were two that were part-time that made 30,000 and under. That's the numbers I have for you there. Mm, all right. And so y'all might be wondering, then, this sounds really cool, how can I start doing stuff with this? So you're already on it by kind of doing digital illustration. We use Photoshop and Illustrator and Adobe Suite, Procreate, anything like that. Um, some software that you might not be particularly familiar with is if you're interested in like the 3D stuff. Um, I've got a list of tools up here. I particularly teach Blender, which I would recommend because it's free. So y'all can download it on your computers and start playing around with it. It runs on Macs and Windows and everything like that. And your computer's a potato. 
good luck. But, um, you can use the school computers, right? So um, I would recommend going ahead and starting there. But one thing I really want to impress on y'all is that it's not so much about learning a specific program as much as just understanding the concepts behind things. So when you're trying to grow into the field, so long as you have a pretty solid foundation of like lighting and shadow and how to represent a human figure and you have like a good discipline of like, you know, life study drawings are a huge one for us, being able to do a still light. Those very fundamental artistic concepts um, are really, really important and those are the ones that take a lot of practice to learn, right? Like those are the skills that you gotta keep honing. That's what we look for in your portfolios. The rest of the stuff, the tools, the multimedia, the, the shiny, sparkly things, um, we'll teach you. Um, we don't necessarily expect people to come in and do that stuff. But of course, that being said, if you're really excited about something like trying 3D, just try it. The cool thing about Blender 2 is that it's open source and free, so that you can just hop on YouTube and start learning tutorials. Um, and I would really encourage you to dive in. It's a big, complicated program, but it's a digital tool, just like Photoshop or any other program that you might be familiar with. All right, and just to give you all just a little kind of like example of what it might look like to walk through the process, I'm gonna check how I'm doing on time. Okay, well we started a little bit late, but I think I'm doing okay. So, um, one of the educated officers asked if we could include just like a little process work of what it looks like to create something from start to finish. So I pulled these, um, this is a life cycle poster that I created when I was a graduate student way back in the uh, older days and um, the process for creating a medical illustration, um, what I did include up here is, first of all, lots of research. I couldn't find my notes, but it's just pages and pages of research. Of. In this example, the starry-eyed hermit crab and its life cycle. And it's kind of cool because it sticks anemones on its shelf, and I just really wanted to make that in 3D for my class, so that's why I went with this. Um, so after you've done a ton of research and you break it down, for example, the starry-eyed hermit crab doesn't actually have a lot of people studying it, so we don't concretely know for certain what its life cycle stages are, but we can look at things related to the starry eyed hermit crab and kind of extrapolate from that. So this is how you can kind of fill in the gaps of like, okay, this hasn't been studied, so maybe I make a poster talking about how it should be studied more, right? And so I then make a thumbnail. Um, this is actually really itty bitty. I blew it on for the sake of this presentation. Um, but I'm basically just kind of establishing what's my overall compositional flow. So mine is a bit of an S composition. You start in the upper right hand corner. And then you kind of do a loopy flow all the way down to the bottom left, which is in the foreground. So I'm, make, I'm thinking about foreground, background, background. I'm thinking about how are your eyes moving through this piece from one bit of information to another? And how can I use visual elements in order to make sure people don't get lost in the sauce going through this piece? I did that by having those little like floaty eggs and things. Always make sure that you're just kind of naturally sweeping through it. I also think about things like color scheme. What's going to make my main subjects really pop? So then step two then, that I've got to show you, is my first initial 3D rendering. And I made some questionable sleep deprived decisions like making the rocks purple, which I couldn't tell you why, but I did. Um, and really just kind of doing my first pass of things like 3D models. So from step one to step two, there's like, you know, 30 hours of work in between. Um, but um, the whole point being that I just start laying things out and kind of seeing, does this work? What do I need to adjust? After that is getting feedback. And this is one of the key components of medical illustration specifically, is getting feedback regularly. It's not really a field where you can like be given a prompt, go away, and just come back with a finished masterpiece. You really have to like get a lot of constant feedback all the way through. So I went to my classmates, and I'm like, okay, what do you think? And they're like, well, the rocks are purple. And I'm like, yeah, they sure are. <laughs> I think I'll change that, you're right. Um, and so after that then, you eventually reach the final piece. Um, so I thought the one previous, I was really proud of it when I did it, but all of that feedback I got from my classmates allowed me to kind of really push it after that, um, which is why it's so important. So they had a lot of really great recommendations, like, you know, marrying the background with the foreground and adding caustics, which is like that, like, light that gets casted on, like, the shell of the hermit crabs and stuff like that, so it really sells underwater. Um, I still have critique on this, but it's old, so it's fine. Um, <laughs> So that's the process, and I'm just showing you three steps here, but really it's an iterative process. So it's really probably, if you're working with a client, it's going to be more like sketch, show client, start over, sketch, show client, start over, <laughs> sketch, get approved, 
rough draft, show client. They actually didn't like that start over, you know, like there's a lot of that. So <laughs> you gotta roll with it. Um, client management is oftentimes one of the hardest parts. Um, also, I just included this here because it's fun to show. Is this what the actual 3D model ended up looking like for my crowd? Um, so I made this in one of the 3D modeling classes in the graduate program. Um, so you learn, you learn how to make 3D models and they're very fun to do. So I ended up making this crab and I actually just copy pasted it for all three crabs. It's the same crab all the way through. <laughs> one just has eggs and one doesn't have a shell and you take it and the other one has a different shell. Um, so the whole point of that being um, work smarter, not harder with medical illustration. Um, you, can, you can spend all the time in the world lovingly rendering everything individually, but we need to always stay zoomed out on the greater message. Nobody would care if I spent time modeling three different crabs. Nobody's gonna know. So I just copy paste it. All right. So we are now going to go to kind of a little kind of activity question things. Um, but I want to pause here real quick and ask, are there any questions before I continue? Mm -hmm. Making sense so far? Cool. Thumbs up, thanks, Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Connor. <laughs> Those are my buddies. Okay. So as I get here and think about this animation activity, I realize I didn't bring my tablet to draw. Um, so, huh? What are you pointing at? Oh, there's a question. Hi, what's up? How long does it take to do like one potter? You said that, oh, so you have to draw it and then get projected. Like, how long yes. is that possible? Yes. So, that is, that is kind of a loaded question because it depends on the individual project. Um, and really one of the greatest skills I, you can learn as a medical illustrator is to start getting a good sense of like how long things are going to take you. So I would say a project where your client keeps saying do it again, do it again, do it again is probably going to be months. Um, and that's not even months of you constantly doing things. It's probably like you make something for like four hours, you send it off, you wait a week for the client to get back to you. Um, and you're in a week. Um, but uh, all said and done, it's probably just flowing pretty smoothly for something like that poster. I would say maybe like 30 to 40 hours total for all of the different assets. Um, and for animation, it can be hundreds of hours, depending on how long the animation is and how complicated it is. Um, and the further you go down specifically in the animation pipeline, the harder it is to change things, right? So you don't necessarily want your client to look at your college animation and be like, actually, can we change the script? Because you have to know, no, we can't, not enough, no. Um, but they try. <laughs> you don't understand how much work goes into it. So that's why in the animation activity I'm about to show y'all is I'm gonna show y'all some of the initial planning stages we need to go through for specifically an animation so that we can have a really good blueprint for what we're gonna make. Um, and I'm applying specifically to medical illustration, but it's kind of the case for all animation because animation is a very time intensive activity. You wanna have all of your teeth crossed, all of your ducks in a row before you actually hop into the animation program and start doing anything. Um, so I realized I was going to do some live drawing for y'all. I forgot to bring my stylus and everything, so I'm going to wing it, whatever. Um, <laughs> I'll move over to Slido. So what I want y'all to do is we're going to name a scientific topic or something you've learned lately that fits within the realm of anatomy or science. I hope somebody will learn something. Uh, <laughs> and I'm just going to pick one that I think would make a fun animation, and y'all can help me vote too. Prenatal development, epigenetics, protein folding, grass spine structure, muscle movements. Gestation, population dynamics, tissue death, fracture of the kid, metal particle bones, specifically, genes, jellyfish life cycles, orbitals. Blood blisters when wrestlers smack each other around. Yes, that's a tempting one. Um, <laughs> if flux pump, I don't know what that is. Ecological hazard. Okay, one more person's typing. Surgery on a rat's brain to inject cancer? What? <laughs> that's gnarly. Okay, a couple more people are typing. Mitochondria, which are the powerhouse of the cell. Lipolysis. Lipolysis. I think I said that really weird. Motor neuron synapse on the end plate. Okay. 
of all these topics, somebody shout out one that sounded fun. All at once. All Jelly Beach Life Cycle. Okay, we're gonna do that one. Um, the blood blisters on the wrestlers, I think, was like a close second for me, though. Okay, so we're gonna do, in theory, the beginning stages of creating an animation for a jellyfish life cycle. So I personally know nothing about a jellyfish life cycle. Um, you might, you might not. Uh, doesn't matter at the moment. Whoops, I have another poll, JK. The next question is, I'm gonna hide these results so you can't see. Who are we making this for? And I just moved it like three or a couple categories, but like there's a lot of more specific categories you can go down, right? Um, so go ahead and vote. Tell me what category we're making this animation for. All right. Oops, wrong computer again. Show results. Okay, we are making this for either children A5 and below or children. Uh, 15 to 10, which is a typo, it's supposed to be 5 to 10. Um, <laughs> anyway, so let's just do it for kids 10 and below. How about that? All right, I can't remember my next question. Where is this going to be presented then? Um, at a conference to a patient in a doctor consultation? Um, you could do one on YouTube, part of a commercial. Something else. If y'all have another idea, we'll do the chat out too. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and show the results on YouTube. Okay, that makes sense. I would have loved the if y'all wanted to challenge me with the two occasion and an offer consultation, because then we can make something about a truly your child jellyfish thing. Um, that'll be fun. But on YouTube. Okay. So if it's on YouTube, then maybe we're imagining that. The kids just like wandering YouTube, right? And we're just learning about life cycles. So maybe it's like a marine life cycle. At a conference where the conference of five-year-olds that, you know, they go to yearly. Big fan of that one. <laughs> uh, big fan. Anyway, okay. I think that's all my polls. Cool. So we are making something about the jellyfish life cycle for kids under 10. And uh, it is going to be on YouTube. So the whole point of me asking all of that was before you get to ever start making the animation, you have to think about what you're making, who it's for, and where it's going to be presented, which is really a good practice for literally anything you make, particularly where it's going to be presented. So y'all are digital digital artists. So is it going on Instagram? Is it going on Twitter? What are the ideal dimensions if it's going on A or B? Stuff like that, right? So we do the same regardless, you know, if I'm going to put this at a conference and it's going to be on a billboard the size of this room, I'm going to design it differently than if it's going to be on somebody's phone. So it's going to be on YouTube. And now we have to wonder, what are some of the major things a five-year-old is going to care about when it comes to like, you know, jellyfish life cycles? What do y'all think is going to captivate them? So first of all, what I'm going to do is... uh. Google jellyfish life cycle. And this is my first step for anything I ever visualize. You can see there's already some pretty cool ones. Oh, I do know about this. This is actually really gnarly because they become like plants for a while and then they become jellyfish. It's insane. And they're actually like a colony of microorganisms that all work together in tandem, which is also insane. So <laughs> really cool, right? But um, what do you think a five-year-old cares about? Fun colors make it talking. Nice. What else does a five-year-old care about? Give it a personality. Yes. Okay. Y'all are kind of hitting my point here. Uh, we have designed for what they're interested in. We have to engage them. So in this play, in this case, perhaps personal characters come to mind as a way we can, you know, have a, a jellyfish animation. So this was going to be the point where I started doodling for y'all. And I'm really sorry because I forgot my tablet. Um, we've got pizza though. So it's for us, not me. <laughs> <laughs> for me. <laughs> so I'm so sorry I forgot my tablet. But um, I will just talk through kind of what I was going to do for the rest of this. And then maybe I can pop into the mirror and model. Does that sound fun? All right. 
So, um, <laughs> so I can have maybe, maybe in this case, my idea, this is kind of the ideation phase. So maybe I have a jellyfish talking to the five right? Or do I want to have a jellyfish that's going through some kind of adventure, like for example, it's food system? Do I want to have, you know, a person talking to each other? How do I want to kind of communicate this concept? My brain goes to a jellyfish being like, hey, nice to meet you. I'm your friend. Let me tell you about me. You know, that sort of thing. Um, and maybe even including parts that are very important, like pausing so they can talk to the screen. Yeah. Oh, you can also draw the chalk. We're going to have to look at this chalk. I have not used the chalk part since like 2009. Wow. Oh my God. Okay. Okay. So, you know, if we're going to start conceptualizing a, uh, a story for them. And this might be hard for y'all to see. I don't know if like I have enough room here. But you would essentially create what's called kind of a rough storyboard or low fidelity storyboard. So low fidelity storyboard. A low fidelity storyboard uh looks something like this. And this is what I was gonna draw for you digitally. But you're basically going to establish what are my main characters, what are my main messages, and how can I convey that as briefly as possible. A good rule of thumb is that for an animation that's going to be two to three minutes long, one or two concepts max you want to communicate. So I might be able to have a jellyfish say something like, hello, uh, I'm a jellyfish. Here are my sages. Bye. Like, <laughs> that's probably not what you got at that time. So one of the lessons I would like to give y'all that you'll impress your animation company with that that line is like saying that you know you can't overload a lot in your script. You gotta keep it really concise. Um, so I've thrown off by this chalkboard thing. Can y'all that? <laughs> I'm trying to think of how to start this. So first of all, you know, you would draw a couple of storyboard frames. And the important part of a good storyboard frame is not that it's a perfect rectangle, but that it is in the aspect ratio that is going to be your final animation. So a lot of people will do like a four by three storyboard, for example, like one of these. See how that's those dimensions feel a little square. And then they will get to their animation and it's a 16 by nine. That is the common format, right? Four by three, 16 by nine. So you want to start off with kind of those like short, longer rectangles so that you're planning your frames correctly. And a good storyboard is going to, A, be ugly in your first iteration, and B, convey the motion as clearly and concisely as possible. If there's anywhere that your storyboard frame is getting a little bit too complicated, it's probably because you have too much going on in the scene. So, I like these, this is enjoyable. Let's see, how do we want to start the animation? If we're having a character talk to a five-year-old, maybe we have the character walk in on screen. So I think I'm going to start off with having just a few bubbles just kind of moving up in our scene. And this is called setting the scene, right? Where you are taking a moment in your animation to kind of establish the overall environment. They do this in every kind of animated media too. If you all start watching, Learning and train is going to start with the scene of the building or the location or kind of just like the world in which you are in. Great, great thing to do, especially for kids who are otherwise maybe not going to process like that we're underwater. So you also here, I drew some circles and then I drew some arrows and that is where I would leave it for my first storyboard frame. The important part is to convey motion. So I am conveying that some bubbles are going to move upwards, right? And then the next frame, I have to think about how we get from frame A to frame B. So perhaps the bubbles float off screen. And then I have, you know, a little jellyfish guy. Maybe he waves to you. And he kind of leans in on the screen. And he's got a cute little face. Nailed it. <laughs> so, you know, the bubbles float up. I have this underwater scene. And I have a jellyfish come in. And then I would write below on my storyboard the script of what I want him to say. Um, and then I would have to choose if my jellyfish is then going to show you, let me show you my family, or let me show you how I was born. 
how do I get from frame number two to frame number three? Um, let's take this example. Let me see. I need to look at the jellyfish life cycle again. There we go. So he starts off as a planus larva, which develops from a fertilized egg. So he might say something like, you know, hang on. My little jellyfish is here. And perhaps he just says, I started for a minute and it like pops into being, and you have a sound effect. So if I had a sound effect, I would have a S F X pop. Right? So, you know, this is a very basic example. Um, a probably pretty like self-explanatory, but you would go through this for every single stage in your animation. And then you would send it off to your client who's going to be like, this is the best jellyfish I've ever seen in my life. Or realistically, they're going to say, uh, make it less fun. <laughs> if you're working with a lot of like for equal clients, they will no funds allowed. Um, so I get excited when I can have fun. But uh, once you get through that process, everybody signs off on the storyboard. And it's even useful sometimes to hand your storyboard to somebody else and say, can you describe to me what's happening in each scene? I forget this to you, y'all would say, okay, bubbles are floating up, a jellyfish moves in from the uh, side of the screen, and then a thing pops into his hand. If there was any point where you're like, well, there was something there, and then there's something there, and I don't know how we get from A to B, that's a good sanity check for you that I'm going to have issues animating that. So that is kind of the fundamentals of how you would create a storyboard. Once they've been completely signed off on, you can start making the digital assets. Um, the whole reason I kind of had this exercise is because I think people really want to dive into the cool media stuff before they want to plan out something like an animation. You really need to plan out something like an animation before you do it. You will have a much better time. So if you're ever interviewing for something that has to do with animation and you say that one of the most important parts of the animation is planning and is going to make your interviewer very happy, um, <laughs> it would make me very happy. So if you're interviewing for my grad program in a few years, I'll give you the wink and the thumbs up. <laughs> But all right, with all that being said and done, uh, I know I arrived about 20 minutes late. So if somebody does need to take off since it's 917, feel free. But for anybody who wants to hang around, I can show you a little bit about kind of what goes into making something like a jellyfish in Blender. Um, I do not have a mouse. Um, is there a mouse I can use up here perhaps? There we go. Operation Jellyfish is ready to go. All right, so this is not going to be a comprehensive tutorial in Blender. If you all never used 3D before, this is not the moment you're going to learn. Um, but <laughs> if you wanted that, I did a three hour lecture for Dari's class earlier today. Um, it would take about three hours. So, I mean, I would like to eat my pizza at some point. <laughs> anyway, so. I will just kind of show you generally the thought process and what goes into creating something like a jellyfish. So step one, pick a type of jellyfish that you would like to model. Even if we're creating a cartoon jellyfish for a five-year-old, we still have to think about accuracy. Uh, just kind of for like, if we're trying to do an educational topic, there's kind of some integrity to it of like, you know, even if it's extremely simplified, well, we'll pick a type of jellyfish and make it that type of jellyfish. Um, so let's see, what kind of jellyfish are there? No, nope, types of jellyfish. And I'm not joking, this is like how you do medical illustration. Um, oh, there's many. See, there's even posters on like types of jellyfish, which were probably made by medical illustrators. This is a specific one that's immortal. Immortal jellyfish? What? Yeah, yeah. It's like when it's more of its damage, it basically just becomes a polyp again, and then it just replants and something like that. It's called a teraposis something. Uh, dorny. Dorny, yes. All right, let's take a look at one of these guys. Oh, those are cool. All right, I'm gonna make one of these. <laughs> so, the so next step, if you're a 3D artist starting to make 3D things, is that you have to really think about the breakdown of shapes. What is this thing? And like, how do I make it, right? So I see kind of a little like half circle at the top with another circle inside. 
and then a bunch of little wiggly guys, right? So I can do this, no problem. Mm -mm -mm. So the first thing I'm going to do is every single 3D mesh starts from a primitive object, or just a very basic object like a cube or a sphere or a cone or something like that. So I'm gonna start with the sphere. I'm then gonna go and delete half of my sphere. Um, so I'm gonna select all these points and delete them. And pop back over, so now I've got this nice little half shell. Let's see, what else did the other one on? He kind of has like, it's like fused and then wraps around. Okay, I'm not even gonna do that yet. I'm gonna make his little spindly bits. Um, am I going to? No, I am, I lie. I think what I'm then going to do is extrude these little normals and bring it inwards. There we go. So I've just kind of brought my geometry inwards in order to create, you know, the beginnings of this little shell. And then I see it's like got this little polypy thing. And if I were doing this properly, what I would do is research specifically what the heck that is, that red bit, and make it look nice. Um, but, you know, we're going to kind of go with what we've got. So I'm going to come in here then and select my series of, of rings here, just like an edge. And I am going to extrude that downwards and probably extrude one more time, and then I'll fill that cap. So now I've got kind of like, if I go into my 3D view here, or my wireframe view, you can see I've got a dome, a second dome, and then some shapes inside that dome. And so if you've never seen 3D before, hopefully this impresses upon you, it's just about selecting edges and shapes and kind of pushing and pulling, extruding and manipulating those. And I'll show you a fun thing called sculpting too before we're done. Now to make the spindly bits. So I'm gonna do a couple of different things. I'm going to first make the first little like tentacle, right? I'm gonna do that with something called a curve real quick. I don't want a this here. I want a path. And I'm going to rotate this around, scale it, rotate it, and just kind of get this somewhere where it kind of makes sense, right? So all this is is a line in space. So you can see I've got my little curve. I'm going to go ahead and give my curve some thickness by coming into my bevel tab here and creating some thickness, right? These are actually really, really thin, but I've made them somewhat thicker so that y'all can see. Now, I could then just copy paste this all around, but I think what I'm going to actually do is use math. There's these things called modifiers, and what modifiers do is mathematical repetitive operations that you would rather not do by hand. Um, that's kind of the short version of it. And one tenant of 3D is always work smarter, not harder. So if there's a way to automate something, they probably have, and there is probably a button for it somewhere in your application. So I could theoretically, you know, create an array of these. And as I create an array, you can see I can crank up this value, and now I have a bunch of spots, right? So I've, of course, got to play around with how this thing is kind of moving around my shape. So I can play around with my offset. I'm actually not so sure if this is going to get me what I want it to do. Object offset. What does this do? Yeah, that's interesting. This is also very normal for 3D, by the way. It's like this. And this is what goes on the Instagram stories. Like, well, I made a jellyfish. Um, anyway, OK, so I could do it that way, or I could just copy paste. My, my whole little spiel there, I don't think, landed in the end, because I'm going to copy paste anyway. But uh, if I was thinking this through further, I could probably think of a slightly better way to do it. But I might go through and, you know, give it some arms. Right? So, whoop, those were not in the direction I wanted them to be at all. Anyway, just for the sake of brevity, we're going to say this is good. It's not good, but let's say it's good. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and I'm gonna. That's pretty good. I'm doing my best up here. I knew what I was setting up for too, because I'm like, I'm gonna model something on the fly. That's easy. No problem. For people's context, by the way, I've been 3D modeling since about 2016, 2015. So I'm creeping up on a decade of 3D modeling experience, which freaks me out now that I'm saying it out loud. Um, but I picked it up my senior year of undergrad because I didn't want to do chemistry anymore. 
literally, that was it. I was doing it instead of my chemistry capstone. And now look at me. <laughs> anyway, so there's a lot of things we can do here in 3D to kind of, you know, speed up the process. For example, I shaded my geometry smooth there, and I can now go in and give it a material and some color. So I'm going to go ahead and pop over and give it a material, and what a material basically is, is like giving it a look and a feel and some color. So in this case, He's going to be, you know, transparent with a little red thing in the middle. Um, so I'm going to make it like a light blue. And I'm going to do some shenanigans so it can be transparent. And crank down my alpha. There we go. So you can see now, by adding the material to it, I can start to add layers of complexity to my object. And there's a lot of ways you can go in and like paint specific portions of it. I will not be UV unwrapping at this time of night. I am sorry. Um, for those of you that know what that is. But I can come in here and assign a material to my object. And so after you create every asset, it's also a pretty good idea to then go get that like sanity check by your client or your professor or whoever um, to make sure it's accurate, to make sure it looks like they want it to look um, before, once again, you get too far down into your uh, journey and have to do stuff over. Also, rotating in 360 is important because uh, we are trying to simulate 3D objects on a 2D screen. So, uh, you know, that can be hard. Hard to see where things are. I've got a jellyfish. It's, it's good. You know, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so I might also come in here and maybe give him a little smiley face or something, right? And I might even just do that with shapes. So what if I just create a circle? Is this even what I want? I don't know. Uh, there we go. So maybe this is going to be an eye. So I can come in here, scale this down. Oh, somebody's going to do something. Me too. I've got to eat pizza. <laughs> I know, I'm just, I'm filling the air, is what it's called. Maybe I'll like this black. And then I'll duplicate this and make that. And then I'll duplicate that. And then maybe I'm going to. Scale it out. And scale it down. <laughs> you know what? Done. <laughs> so, yeah, you pretty, pretty interesting, pretty quick. Now, yeah, I would spend more time on this. <laughs> Honestly, if a student turned this in for a grade, I would be delighted. Like, would, this has so much personality, no joke. Um, but <laughs> so perhaps now we've got a new character for a jellyfish animation, or we've at least got a block out of one. So I can theoretically go in and set up some frames with a character like this and just make sure it all makes sense. And I can always swap this out later for, for a jellyfish that's actually rigged to be animated. And that's a whole 3D thing, which I will not be going into tonight. Um, with that being said, I would say that's probably about the end of what I've got for y'all. Are there any questions before we wrap up? Yeah, what's up? So do you stage before you feel confident in carrying on. So if it's a small team, it's about identifying the key members that have a stake in it. If you're working with clients, it's about having a very frank conversation with your client of like, okay, you're going to see it, who needs to review it, and then who actually needs to review it. Because we're going to have people who have like no business reviewing it, and then they're going to have people who should see it who don't. Um, so it can be about like getting the right eyes on it at the right time. But usually, if you're just kind of like doing your own project, having one or two people you trust just take a look at it and make sure, like, yes, this makes sense to my brain, um, is a good place to go to carry on. Um, if you're working with a client, you would want them to just give you an official sign-off. And by that, I mean the exact email words of everybody important has seen this and has signed off on it. So that if they go back on it, then they go back on it. You can copy paste that and be like, as per this last email. <laughs> <laughs> Which is professional talk for you said, um, <laughs> and, and then, you know, if, if the project managers then duke it out. Um, so, yeah, 
So one or two, um, you definitely don't want to get caught in review purgatory. So sometimes it's about asking the right questions too. So sometimes it's about saying, hey, at this point in time, I'm really focused on how things move from one frame to the next. Does this make sense? Are there any points where you feel like you're going to get motion sick? You know, sometimes when you're doing like cells and things, you start at the bottom, you zoom in, and then you zoom out, and then you zoom in, and then you zoom out, and it feels like a little bit worse to the So it's another one thing with my students. I'm like, I'm going to get motion <laughs> um, you know, so happy people and like, asking them specific questions. Hey, I'm thinking about these colors for this. You know, does this make sense? Do you think the things pop that you want to pop? If you're looking at this, what do you think is the main important part of this? And how can you tell you? If they say a jellyfish, and you're like, yeah, I got you. I got it. Um, you know, so uh, it's about learning questions to ask to make sure your review rounds are like one or two people and like one or two different. But you do want to build in time. So if y'all are ever working on doing next project and any sort of by the way, in your timeline, build in time for you send the rough draft to the client. They take two weeks to review. Uh, they send it back to you. You take a couple more weeks to you know do revision, send to them, they reveal, they sign off. And you let them know, even if I agree to have this done, say by the end of the month, if you take a long time to review, it will not be done by the end of the month. <laughs> you know what I mean? Which is, you know, seems obvious, but it's like amazing how many like clients just don't consider. Yeah, I found this for two weeks. And theoretically, gave the artist in two days and for two days to get everything else done. Um, so that's what they need to hear about. Also, kind of even be like, hey, in order for us to stick to our timeline, please have any comments back by next date. And then I'll move that and underline it. And then I'm ready. <laughs> Make it, right? <laughs> so, you know, just so. Um, yeah. So how do you keep yourself from getting too deep in like details? How do you keep your mind so much like any step back and see the big that's a great question? And that's definitely the practice. I would say the first iteration of anything, you may first animation or science visualization, you will get deep in all things Um and I think it's really cool with that series and then coming up for air or something like class or critique where people will point out some of the very fundamental things. And the more you go through that process, the more you're going to be training the brain to focus on the right things at the same time. Um, so there's no like great tip for like how do I make sure I'm focusing on the right thing, but it's always about making sure, like stepping back and being like, okay, what is the purpose of that line? What is the purpose of a little story? What is the purpose of doing really basic community character models? Which is kind of straight place you know? And sometimes people are going to get the hours too. So if you're making a price for something, you're thinking, okay, I've got 40 hours to spend on this. How many hours do I want to spend on the product? That means how many hours should I be spending on this little graph? And that is also something that you kind of have to do a couple of times to get a feel for what's like an appropriate number of hours. To take a for So that's a not answer to your question, but uh, hopefully that's an answer. Any other questions? Yeah, that's good. Do you have a website or a social media that anyone can use to follow or contact? Absolutely. So I don't really have a lot of social media because I teach, I don't do art much anymore. But Beavis, the program, biomedical visualization that I teach at, does have an Instagram. Um, and they would be excited. They also have a Twitter. But um, UIC, Beavis, Instagram, I'll bring it up. So this is managed by our uh, Student Association of Medical Artists. So this is our student group. Um, and they will basically just post things like stuff that they are working on in their stories is often a lot of student work. Right now they are doing a trust a -thon where 26 of our students are getting together in order to create an interactive experience to raise money for our program, um, which is really cool. We will have interviews up here. They will often do like little like just like insights and stuff like that. Our program director just retired, so he's on here. Um, they have student like showcases and features, so you can see the current students and what they're doing. They will also post also post event links and stuff like that. So our students do post webinars of uh, just like a day in the life of a medical illustrator and stuff like that. So if what I'm saying is interesting to you, but you feel like I'm not quite you can get the most objective perspective that you would like to hear from the students themselves. Um, we do have some webinars down the line that um, we can talk on as well. If you follow their Instagram and the Twitter, um, you will be up to date as well. So the Instagram is just UIC underscore Beavis. And I think the Twitter is the same. 
um, and Twitter. There we go. Yep, UIC Divas is on Twitter as well. So um, Twitter has some more of like our work. You can see here for the Trustathon, um, they doodled themselves and their different teams, which is really cute. So uh, they've organized 26 members into a pre-production team, art direction team, programming team, renaissance team, um, which is like our marketing like big picture team, based upon the strengths of those individual students. So I'm not actually running this, I'm my colleague Sam Bond is, but um, it's usually very fun every year. So yeah, feel free to go ahead and join. Also, by the way, our retired program director, this is his artwork. He is insane. Like, blows my mind how phenomenally good. You might see this places. There's actually in Chicago a dentist who has this that he, he like bought a print of it. And I'm like, that's the guy I like art from. That's my program director and a random dentist in Chicago. Um, you know, he makes phenomenal work. So you feel free to scroll through here and just kind of see some of the other stuff that we've got going on. Any other questions? No? Great. Well, thank you so much for attending. Letting me talk your ear a lot past the time I was supposed to. Um, it was a blast. Hopefully you learned something. Hopefully this field sounds as exciting as what I think about it. Um, and if you have any other questions or want to reach out at any point, I do have in my presentation my own contact information as well. So um, I'm always happy to chat. You're absolutely welcome to send me an email. Um, I have my office telephone number there. Don't call me. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I, I do it. Um, and um, we do things like if you are curious about a specific aspect, if you would like a tour, if you would like a portfolio review of like, I'm interested in this, how does my artistic portfolio stand? I can't tell you whether or not I'm getting, but I can give you some recommendations. I'm like, I can use some focus a little bit more on this. I think you're still in this area are really good and you more than one to be to help better your chances of getting into the program. Um, you want to send me pictures of your pets or just talk or whatever, feel free to reach out. Thank you so much. Thank you.